Make sure we're recording. Yes. Yep, we're good. We're good to go. Okay. This is the Regional Emergency Medical Advisory Committee and Medical Standards, medical standards Subcommittee of New York City. Uh, March 9th, 2021. Please call, uh, let me know if you're here when I call your name. Paul Barbara. Here. Jonathan Berkowitz. Here. Cindy Basilios. <clears throat> Joseph Bove. Cindy should be here, I saw her name. Okay, I'll go back to her. Neil Semelovic. Here. Wallace Carter. Robert Krupe. Jeffrey Douglin. Hold on. The host has stopped our video. What happened? It says recording still on my screen. Okay. Mine says host has stopped your video. I just I just switched off your camera, Marie, because it wasn't coming over correctly. Oh, okay, okay. No one needs yeah, to you can turn anyway. you can turn it back on, but your camera is covered. That's okay. Well, let me just go back to what I was doing. Okay, Jeffrey Douglin. Lauren Kosturko. Reed Caldwell. Do you have a meeting? Okay, I'm going to mute. Okay, okay mute yourselves, guy. David LaBelle. I'm in attendance. Thank you. David Eng. Here, Henry. Thank you. Jeff Rabrich. Here. Michael Redliner. I'm here. Great. Dr. Schenker is not here today. Anthony Shalish. Here. Raphael Torres. Jason Zimmerman. I'm here. Thank you. Nick Alexandru. Hi, Marie. I'm here. Hi, Nick. Uh, Glenna Seda. Here. David Benelli. I'm muted. Present. Thank you. Dario Gonzalez. Here. Uh, Doug Isaacs. Brad Kaufman is not here. Anne-Marie Grigenti. Here. Thank you. Kevin Ward. Here. Okay. Grace uh, Cassiola. Here. Greater uh, Madeline Fong. Sean Graves. Robert Ackerman. Here. Thank you. Morty Lax. Here. Okay. Art Cooper. Here. Great. Uh, Robert Goldstein. You did your Langsome. Present. Lewis Marshall. Kevin Munjal. Present. Jessica Van Voorhees. Okay, now that was medical standards. Now I'm gonna do Remax. Sorry if I call your name again, but it'll be done soon. Okay. So this is Remax. Robert Winchell. Here. Thank you. Joseph Schenker is not here. Uh, Robert Ackerman. Here. Thank you. Nick Alexandru. I am here. Eric Cohen. Kevin Mundal. I'm here. I'm here. That's, that's Eric. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Kevin Mundal. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Cindy Basilios. Here. Thank you. Grace Casciola. Here. 
Okay. Glenn Aceda. Here. Dario Gonzalez. Here. Nathan Reisman. Present. Kevin Ward. Here. Anne Marie Grigenti. Here. Thank you. Samia McEachin or Allison Burke. Here. Thank you. Jeff Rabrich. Here. Reed Caldwell. Jonathan Berkowitz. Here. Thanks. Lewis Marshall. Michael Redliner. Here a second ago. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, we'll come back. Laura Aviacoli. Here. Stu Kessler. Matthew Fink. Wallace Carter. I thought Dr. Carter was here. Dominic Batnelli. I am here. Thanks, Dom. Thank you. Efren Rendon. Is Efren still part of the organization? Because he hasn't been here in a year. We'll have to figure it out. Peter Wire. Here. Paul Barbara. Present. And David Benelli. In one of these little boxes. Okay. Celia Quinn. Tim Stiles. Present. Thanks. Mark Cantor. Here. Thank you. Um, Joseph Bove. Sean Graves. Present. Good evening. Good evening. Matthew Harris. Maria Bodick. Robert Krupe. I'm here. Great. Jessica Van Vries. Art Cooper. Here. You did your Langsome. Present. Anthony Shalish. Here. Okay, give me a second. So I Red Leonard's here. Red Leonard's here. I'm not, I'm here for both. Red Leonard is here. Okay. Good. Hold on, let me just find you and okay, let me just count the docs. One. It's one. Two. Three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Okay, we have a quorum. We can go forward. Excellent. All right, so first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the last meeting. This is the joint REMAC medical standard minutes. Um, everyone is sent out for review. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? With the reverse. If anyone opposed. Okay, Does anyone have an, anyone opposed? Seeing none, the meetings are, the minutes are approved. Correspondence report, Murray. There is no correspondence since the last meeting, um, which is surprising, but there is no correspondence. So that's Excellent. good. Okay, and the executive committee did not meet. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Benelli. Um, Excellent. Can I just ask, is anybody, yeah. well, I'm gonna call a phone number to see who this person is. I have someone that's a 760-705-8888. Anybody recognize that number? No. Okay. 760, what was the rest? 705-8888. I'm just gonna make a quick call. So I'm going sure. silence for a few. All right. 
going silent. And Dr. Benelli, the show is yours. Thank you. So uh, seeing that we already went through the uh, motion to approve the minutes and we have no correspondence this vote, let's move to the uh, subcommittee reports. I think we'll start with, uh, um, before that, actually, before we move to the subcommittee reports, um, I, uh, we have Dr. Dan Rolston over here. Um, I'm going to allow uh, Paul Barber to introduce him. And uh, we need to, uh, Joe, we need to give uh, Dr. Rolston the ability to uh, present a couple of slides. I also so, um, have his slide deck. If, uh, oh, okay, perfect. Whatever Dan, works. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Um, I know, right, Dr. So, uh, before that, Paul, uh, just apologies on behalf of all of us that we kept you so long last time and we didn't, uh, weren't able to uh, listen to your presentation then. So please go ahead. So but did, uh, Dan is um, just a great guy. I gotta be honest with you. I've worked with him a little bit at North, at North Shore. Uh, Dan's an ED doc who gets it when it comes to EMS. And uh, he's been doing a lot of research on cardiac arrest and um, several conversations we've had offline about bringing ECMO to the area in some form. Um, and Dan is a huge proponent of um, advancing our system of care. And uh, we're gonna in, in initiate uh, an idea on how we can do this and identify stakeholders. And Dan being a subject matter expert is gonna really just start the discussion about bringing eCPR to the, to the New York City area. Um, I'm, I would be remiss to start listing his credentials, but this guy is good. <laughs> and I just wanna give the floor to him. So Dan, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, David. Um, see a lot of familiar faces uh, from St. Luke's, Jeff and Mike, and a lot of people I've met over the past uh, a few months um, working with cardiac arrest stuff um, within the FDNY and Northwell. Um, so it's uh, great to see everybody. And thanks so much for having me to talk about this. Um, so um, I guess the big talk here is about bringing uh, ECMO and ECPR to New York City. Um, uh, so I work on the American Heart Association's Emergency Cardiovascular Care Committee um, uh, with one of the uh, big authors on this trial that we're going to discuss from the Lancet that you guys have probably heard a little bit about, um, but I would just want to go over some of the details a little bit more and uh, bring up some ways that I think this is something that's doable in New York City. Obviously, it's a big uh, systems issue that needs to be figured out in rapid, rapid timing. Um, it's the most time-sensitive disease we deal with, but um, I'll kind of go over some of what they've been doing in Minnesota and see if we can replicate something similar here. So um, uh, just for those who don't know, um, so I, I work in CT ICU, surgical ICU, and the ER. Um, and so we take care of a lot of patients with veno arterial ec uh, ECMO. Um, and this essentially involves placing two very large cannulas, although they're getting smaller and smaller as the technology gets better. One goes into the IVC. Um, it essentially pulls blood out of the IVC into an uh, oxygenator through a pump. Um, and then it shoots it back through most commonly the femoral artery to create retrograde flow um, into the aorta. And this essentially allows for um, perfusion of the brain and your, your heart, um, your kidneys, all your vital organs um, while a patient is in cardiac arrest. So in Minnesota for many years, since about 2015, um, they started a program that was really a combination of care between cardiology and the EMS system there. They have three separate EMS systems that they coordinated care through. Um, and essentially for a patient who was in out of hospital cardiac arrest, um, they would do three defibrillations. They would put them on a Lucas um, if they didn't get them back by that point. Um, and they would transport them and they would actually bypass the ER and go directly to the cardiac catheterization lab. Um, and the results are pretty amazing um, from what they have. Um, they were showing numbers of about 45% survival for you know, almost 200 patients. Um, and compared to historical controls with about 15% survival. So I think the big deal that happened uh, back in November of last year was they did the first randomized control trial that they published in the Lancet, um, looking at the use of ECMO um, for refractory VF, um, NVT technically, cardiac arrest. Um, and um, we've actually had Dr. Yiannopoulos come, he just spoke with us last week at our hospital, um, kind of about their whole program. So it was uh, great to hear and good to, uh, since I didn't get to talk about it last time, I got a little update from him on what's going on. 
So um, the inclusion criteria, because I think this is really important um, for this group, um, essentially um, they, they took patients who were age less than or equal to 75 years old. Um, they had to have out of hospital cardiac arrest of a presumed car cardiac origin. Uh, they had to have initial rhythm of VF or VT. Um, they had to get three defibrillations, as I mentioned, without having rust. Uh, they all got amiodarone, 300 milligrams. They had to fit on the Lucas um, to be transported to the hospital. The estimated time from the scene had to the hospital had to be less than 30 minutes. This can be a little confusing because some people think it's the time from arrest to the hospital has to be less than 30 minutes. Um, that's not the case. Um, and their data um, shows they had times about 45 minutes to get to the hospital. Um, and then they, as I mentioned earlier, they technically bypassed the ER directly to the cath lab. Actually, what they did is they randomized the patient on arrival to the ER to go to either the resuscitation bay or to the cath lab. So, you know, one thing that um, I know is important to EMS um, and that we need to discuss is um, there is a lot of evidence that shows doing on-scene resuscitation is better than transporting patients. Um, and even just in JAMA last year, there was a study that showed, um, you know, there were better uh, survival outcomes with on-scene resuscitation. Um, you know, I think one of the issues we have here is I just want to, I highlighted, you know, for initial shockable rhythm or for PA and asystole, it seems to not matter. The both favored on-scene resuscitation. But as you kind of come down and look at the time uh, of the resuscitation, as that time goes longer and longer, um, the benefit seems to tr uh, favor transport. So as you get to 15 minutes, you kind of lose uh, any benefit to on-scene resuscitation. And as it goes longer than that, um, it really favors intra-arrest transport. And that's why selecting the uh, best patient population uh, to be transported to the hospital, I think is something we need to try to figure out. So um, the exclusion criteria, so these are patients you, you, know, you don't want to put on ECMO. ECMO is meant for people who are, um, you know, the, they have an MI that they had coronary disease they weren't aware of, they walk around, they're active, um, and they have a sudden MI that puts them into VF arrest. So it's not meant for DNR patients, it's not meant for nursing home residents or people with terminal cancer. Um, you have to anticoagulate people who are on ECMO. So while there are some cases where people uh, with trauma, uh, you know, go on ECMO, you don't want people who are bleeding, um, and they excluded people who are drowning or overdoses. Um, and you know, I don't think anyone's gonna be able to figure out if someone's allergic to contrast dye uh, in the field. Um, so if you look at their data out of Minnesota, it's actually incredibly impressive. Their EMS system is, and, and even their bystander uh, CPR rates are really high suggests that there is some selection bias in the patients that they, that, that they selected, but they randomized the patients afterwards. So um, we could see bystander witnessed was about 73%, 86% um, in, in the groups. Um, and then uh, we can see that the you know, bystander CPR rate's really high above 80% as well. Um, and then uh, as we see the EMS scene times uh, were you know, about 22 minutes for each uh, with a transport time of 19 minutes and average uh, time to ED arrival of over 40 minutes. And when you look at the ECMO group versus the standard of care group, uh, really there, it was remarkable the difference. They actually stopped this trial early after only enrolling 30 patients uh, because of the benefit. Um, so ECMO had, you know, 45% uh, um, survival, 42%, sorry, I don't remember exactly, um, but uh, it was much larger than the 6% survival um, in the standard ACLS group. And they actually had one patient withdraw from the ECMO group because he was awake and he didn't want to be in the trial anymore. So it would have been even higher. Um, if he had stayed in. We've been trying a lot to convince our cardiac surgeons at our hospital um, to do ECMO. And I think the biggest limitation uh, to doing it is that, you know, you need a lot of resources in-house 24-7 uh, to be able to do this. Um, it's very expensive to put a patient on an ECMO. Some estimates have it at $300,000 uh, per patient. So, um, you know, looking at the numbers, we see over the past four years, we've seen people, you know, who don't get ROSC in the field coming to our hospital, about uh, 400 patients. And, um, you know, only 37 of those were really eligible for ECMO. So it's a really small patient population. It's only going to be about 10% of the arrests that uh, we see. And, you know, I think the big worry is that people don't want to put people on ECMO and then have them, you know, you know, have them die because they took too long to get onto ECMO. But if you're selecting the right patient population, um, and Minnesota, they're showing survival rates of about 20% uh, 
over 60 minutes. Um, their median time to putting a patient onto ECMO was actually 60 minutes. So we have a code ECMO checklist at our hospital. I know a lot of hospitals are building these, um, but it essentially kind of um, you know, reflects what Minnesota is doing. We do allow for some witness PEA arrests because we do a lot of inter-hospital transports. Um, and um, you know, um, this has been something that's been built between cardiology, emergency medicine, and cardiac surgery, um, but it essentially um, echoes exactly what they do. So you know, some of the things that I hear all the time from um, our cardiac surgeons and our cardiologists is that they want to activate these patients, you know, in the field before they get to the ER, because if they know about them, they can get them on faster. So something that we think would be really helpful for our emergency department is just knowing if you're bringing in a patient who's 75 years old or younger, um, who didn't come from a nursing home and who had this initial VFVT rhythm and you don't have them back yet, um, that would be really helpful to us because that would allow us to pre-notify our cardiac surgeons. And I'm sure other hospitals could do the same thing. You know, I know a lot of the logistics here are kind of up to you guys. I am more work in the hospital. I don't work in EMS. Um, but, uh, you know, I would love to discuss with you guys and just wanted to uh, create a, a discussion about this. And I know, you know, Pam and I have been looking previously at like the numbers of FDNY patients that this could uh, be relevant for. So um, the numbers is much larger than Minnesota, obviously. We have a much larger population. Um, so it's something that I think could be done um, with a limited number of hospitals. Um, one last thing that I wanted to say that Dr. Yiannopoulos brought up last week was, you know, they're bringing all patients from their EMS system to one hospital. Um, so they get a lot of experience with ECMO. They're doing over 30, they're doing 30 to 50 ECMO cases a year. Um, it's increased over time. So, you know, if we spread it out too, too much, um, people also aren't going to have the experience um, with ECMO to be good at it. Their average time to getting a patient on once they get to the cath lab is seven minutes. Our average time at our hospital to get people on is 25 minutes. So um, it's something that you need to work on and need to get a lot of experience with. Thanks so much. For having <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna, I don't think we have an, enough time to open this for discussion now, but a couple of, maybe you can reflect on one thing. Um, and that is the Michigan study, which I sent you a couple of uh, weeks ago um, as to, they're trying to do something that, uh, you know, similar to what we were doing and they were not successful. What are your thoughts as to why they were not successful? Yeah, so in Michigan, they actually tried to look at um, whether you could get patients from their arrest time to their ER within 30 minutes. Um, and as I mentioned, that's just really difficult to do, um, to get a patient to the ER within 30 minutes. Um, and Minnesota didn't really do that. They got patients there within 45 minutes. So I think that's the, the big you know, factor, um, is that they just had really low enrollment because they couldn't get patients there um, as fast as they wanted. Basically, you have to have a, you know, a witness arrest by the EMS crew to get them within 30 minutes. Um, and so you know, they had just really small numbers. So I, I don't know what to make of their, their study. Very good. And one last question, because I'm sure this is a question that we're going to get from a lot of hospitals as to how long do you keep these patients on ECMO without receive, with, before you decide that it's futile? I know that the San Diego guys do it only for hours. So um, in Minnesota, they, if they don't get some sort of a rhythm back um, within, you know, I think it's within two hours. I don't remember the exact time frame, but it's within like 90 minutes or something like that afterwards. Um, then they they call it there in the cath lab. Um, but they have very specific protocols that are made. Um, generally, we kind of do the same that we do that they do because we've used all their evidence to present to our cardiac surgeons. So um, usually it's like uh, 60 minutes to two hours. They'll wait to see if they get a rhythm back, and if they don't, they'll call it. Um, but if they get a rhythm back, they'll bring a patient upstairs to the CTICU, they'll cool them. Um, and the recommendation is not to do any neurologic assessment for uh, 72 hours afterwards. So, Got it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we have a, um, a um, ECMO or eCPR tag uh, that was formed. And um, I know that some people already emailed us or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, last last meeting uh, tried to uh, um, uh, tried to say that they want to uh, participate uh, via the chat. I would like everyone to please uh, email um, 
Joe... I just put in the chat. I just put in the chat, David. Um, so oh, there's a couple I, people I didn't already see the direct chat. message. No, no, yeah, I know you were. No, no. I mean, with no. parallel parallel okay. processing here. Just email myself, David, Marie. Um, you know, I, I don't mind coordinating the names yeah. for now. But the issues that we're talking about, you know, people are, you know, uh, duration of time, what the expectations. It's a lot of ideas about this. We're going to take it offline. Dr. Rolston is, uh, you know, here to help show us what's what's capable. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, I think my communication uh, levels are, are very high. Just text me, email me, whatever, and I'll, I'll maintain the list for Dave and Perfect. Marie and Joe. Uh, excellent. And uh, I would like to preface this with one more thing. Um, we had requests that, um, that from ECMO teams to join this tag. This tag at the moment is limited to the participants uh, in REMAC. It's going to be a small group. Um, and we will reach out to hospitals. Um, so uh, that's just about it for now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ralston. Um, and uh, let's move on with the, um, let's move on. Dan, with do, our, you have a problem with, do you have a problem with them sharing your slides, Dan? No, no, absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you so much All for right. having me. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, Mark, we'll thank get you it out to everybody. Okay, Dan, thank you so much. Um, I think that we can <coughs> move on now with the agenda. I think CNC committee is next, Paul, and I think you also have a presentation, right? We have to make Paul yeah, a co-presenter as well. It'll be quick. It'll be quick. I um, just wanted to give kudos to Kevin Ward and Robert Fazzino for uh, getting through the COVID testing phase and coming out on the other side with uh, without any pitchforks and uh, uh, you know any 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 burned burned in effigy situations. Um, the test seems to be back. Um, we have the new unified test being given. Um, some preliminary data from that shows the stats are about the same with the pass rates and the high and the low. We still have a 20% failure rate, which on first pass. Um, and the mean and the averages and the highs and lows all look, all look very good. The only problem is it's only uh, about 80 students from a uh, medic basic class. Um, so it's really one agency and one level of test taker. It wasn't any refreshers, which are really the people we catch with the test. So um, data to come on the test, but the test appears to be um, revived or, you know, without ECMO, to say the least. Um, the second piece is really um, a work in progress. And I just wanted to share with you all um, the new credentialing workflow for medical control. Um, Stu Kessler, I'm going to let him in. Um, so can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> for those of you who give medical control or those of you who need to take medical control, I'm trying to coordinate it with Marie's help and Joe's help to make it a little more streamlined um, and with less errors and higher quality. Um, so Basically, what you see here, I have a couple of online forms through a REMSCO account that um, are used to track people who actually take a class, okay? The first form, you can use this can QR use code. I can share this with everybody. Um, it basically asks for demographic information about the candidate who's seeking medical control. And it's stratified by where you're doing your course, Okay, so the location of the course is really key to us linking the candidate to the completion of the card, which does seem to have problems for those of you who give, you, you, we all know, right? We all know it, it, it takes months, if not years, right? Um, the medical control facility you, you, you're affiliated with, and then it reminds you for your individual documents to be submitted. We can't attach them here because it's, um, it's not all within the REMSCO email server, but make a long story short. Um, <laughs> If your name is here, I'm expecting you to be a medical control instructor. If you're an, a medical control instructor and your name isn't here, contact me directly and we can add you to this list. I think I just went with who I know is giving. So if I miss someone, it really wasn't intent to exclude you. Um, the people who fill this form out will actually be able to do a pull down and see your name. So when you give a class, they'll sign up and sign up under you. So we'll know that uh, for instance, um, Kevin Munjal, gave a class to you know Peter Venkman. When Peter Venkman's card, card comes through, I'll know it's, it was one of Kevin's people that did the te test. Um, 
this is a little busy. Just under, uh, I don't expect people to really go through this. I do want to show it to you offline, but essentially the instructor holds the class, sets it up on their own. Candidates fill out the form. The material is covered. If you need a slide deck, I'll gladly share the slide deck that I've accumulated throughout the years, but I think we're all experts in the field of uh, emergency medicine in this uh, area. So we expect you to cover the material. Um, you can cover anything internal to your facilities, medical control delivery at that area. The candidate takes the written exam online with a different QR code, different form. I can share that with the, I will share that with the instructors directly. Um, once they take that test online, it's basically a Google quiz uh, through the uh, Office 365 from New York City Ramsco uh, web, um, office suite. We can see how the questions perform. We know who took the test. We know who took the intake. We know who took the class. We know who took the test. We can match up and avoid the cards getting lost. The only branch point from there is if someone is a new candidate, they have to go through uh, some sort of practical and it's uh, not appropriate to send people to fire department telemetry with all the pandemic issues. So if you're giving your class remotely, you can do a face-to-face -face with them. We've standardized some face-to-face uh, -face encounters, whether they're remote, live, whatever. Dr. Kosterka was uh, integral in building basically these oral board cases to essentially voir dire that the candidate can do medical control. And that would be at the discretion of the said instructor. I can go through, that's a little beta testing right now. We'll go through that uh, uh, individually later, but long story short, once the refresher person is done with the class intake form and the written exam, they're done. The grades come to me, I can prompt Remsco and Dina to cut the card from there and we should be closing a lot of loops, okay? That's basically the new process. Um, and I'm willing to work with the people who are on that list offline for medical control. It should streamline a lot of things for us. And that's basically it. Excellent. Thank you. That's the uh, end of the CNC uh, report. Paul? Yes. Mr. Ward, do you have anything? Uh, I think you covered it pretty well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks, Paul. And everyone who really Mark. worked hard on this, uh, on this um, um, endeavor. Thank you so much. Uh, someone wanted yeah, to comment I, something. Yeah, hi, it's Dr. Marshall. Um, I just want to thank Paul and his team for uh, a great thing that they've done with this work. I think it's fabulous. So thank you all very much. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thanks, Dr. Marshall. Strong work, yes. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the protocol uh, committee report. Uh, Dr. Lai, I believe you have access uh, to uh, pull up presentation. Okay, great. I will first, um, I first want to go over um, some of the things that were either um, kind of like a revisit uh, from before as well as a correction. The first protocol I want to go over was is a uh, correction for the previously approved anaphylaxis severe allergic reaction protocol. This one, uh, it was just reviewed that afterwards that there was a um, an omission uh, as we were kind of combining both the adult and the peds into one singular protocol. There was an omission uh, under the paramedic section for the uh, for their epinephrine administration and that previously it was just a singular dose, uh, was not weight-based. So the correction here as in red, as it was, as what it is currently, is now currently reflected in this corrected version where now the par under the paramedics, they will be administering a weight-based dosing of uh, epinephrine 0.01 milligrams per kilogram IM with a maximum of 0.3 milligrams. Uh, so this one is, is just a simple correction. Uh, that's what it was in our original uh, unified protocols and that the transfer process just did not make it through onto the protocols that we originally voted on. I believe that was during the last meeting. So that's Very the good. first protocol to present. Do we need to uh, vote on this, uh, Yadidia? Or oh, Yadidia, are you there? Okay, I guess not. Um, I, I guess you have plan was just like last time we were going to do a right, yeah, vote or affirmative vote for medical standards and an roll call for rematch. Exactly. That's exactly very good. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, before we before we proceed with uh, the dis uh, discussion and then vote, I just want to preface uh, the uh, 
uh, with regard to the protocol committee, we have eight protocols to approve, at least eight. So um, we're gonna run through this uh, relatively quickly. All these protocols were discussed um, uh, extensively uh, some of them ad nauseum um, at the protocol committee. And um, um, they were also sent out for everyone's review uh, before this meeting. So I'm hoping that everyone had the opportunity to look at these protocols and that uh, we'll be able to make this process as uh, efficient as possible. So any discussion with regard to this change? Okay, hearing not, uh, those members of medical standards committee um, ha is there anyone who has any objections or uh, comments or opposes this protocol? Please let me know. Um, otherwise, um, we will take this as a uh, in favor vote from uh, the Medical Standards Committee to be moved forward as second in motion to uh, REMAC. So is there anyone who has any objections or abstains or wants to change anything? Okay, hearing not, Marie, I believe that we can move forward with a roll call for uh, REMAC to approve this protocol. Okay, let me pull up the paperwork. Okay, okay so this is a uh, correction to anaphylaxis. Okay, so I'm going to call names of only REMAC members and REMAC physicians. Your choices are in favor, opposed, or abstain. Robert Winchell. In favor. Nick Alexandru. In favor. Kevin Munjal. In favor. Cindy Basilios. In favor. Dario Gonzalez. In favor. Glenn Seda. In favor. Doug Isaacs. In favor. Nathan Reisman. Yes, in favor. Jeff Rabrich. In favor. Reed Coldwell. In favor. Lewis Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. In favor. Wallace Carter. In favor. Stuart Kessler. In favor. And Peter present. Wa yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> um, Peter Weyer. Yes. Paul Barbara. In favor. David Benelli. Yes. Tim Stiles. In favor. Thanks. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. He's not here, right? Okay. Um, Maria Bodick. Robert Krupe. In favor. And Arthur Cooper. In favor. Okay, the motion carries. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lai, let's move on to the next protocol, please. Sure, give me one second uh, while I find this, uh, here we go. All right, so the next protocol that I do wanna discuss is a protocol that was um, approved by REMAC uh, during our last meeting. And uh, it was after some sort of like continued discussion and after a little bit of, of uh, you know, from a few of the uh, protocol committee members um, we did a little bit further research into the undansetron or the, uh, the Zofran dosing uh, that was previously uh, discussed and approved at REMAC uh, previously, uh, where Zofran was only allowed to be given at uh, 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of 4 milligrams POIV or IM without, a single, uh, without any uh, repeat dosing. Um, we, um, we had some further discussion as well as uh, some further research into, and as well as uh, kind of taking a look at sort of like some of the physicians' uh, clinical practices in their respective emergency departments to, to allow for a, a, a maximum of eight milligrams of uh, Zofran to be given without any repeat dosing by our pre-hospital providers. 
This is some. This is uh, consistent with the total uh, milligram dosing that is um, currently allowed for in our unified protocols, as well as in the uh, state collaborative protocols, um, and is a little bit more in line with um, with with many of our our own clinical practices in the emergency department. So it is uh, coming forward to Remac and medical standards to for the change, as you can see in red on my screen so that it will be for patients greater than or equal to six months of age with severe nausea and or vomiting uh, to be allowed to administer uh, Zofran 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, maximum eight milligrams, PO, IV, or IM. And plus there's an additional advantage over here that it's weight-based dosing and it is uh, unified for both uh, pediatric and adults. Um, any discussion with regard to this protocol? Okay, hearing none, is there anyone on the medical standards uh, committee who opposes or abstains or want to make, wants to make any changes on this protocol? Okay, hearing not, uh, Marie, um, this protocol is being moved to uh, REMAC as a second in motion for approval. We need to do a roll call, unless uh, someone on REMAC wants to do any uh, discussion with regard to this protocol as well. Okay, hearing not, let's just uh, uh, do a roll call. Okay. Okay, again, in, either in favor, oppose, or abstain. Dr. Winchell? In favor. Nick Alexandru? In favor. Kevin Munjal? In favor. Cindy Basilios? In favor. Dario Gonzalez. In favor. Glenna Seda. In favor. Doug Isaacs. In favor. Nathan Reisman. In favor. Reisman. Reisman, I'm sorry. I just need to write down Rice. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Rabrich. In favor, Rabrich. Rabrich. <laughs> Man, after all these years, you guys are giving me all these problems. Hold on. And yours is pronounced Raybridge, Ray. Yes, like there's a oh. Y there. Okay. Reed Caldwell. In favor. Lewis Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. Perfect, Marie. In favor. Yeah, I love your name. <laughs> Wallace Carter. In favor. Another great name. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Kessler. I'm sorry, is Laura here tonight? Yes, Marie, uh, hi. In hi, I'm favor. sorry. No problem, Marie. in favor. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peter Wire. In favor. Paul Barbara. In favor, Barbara. I'm kidding. It's not. It's Barbara. <laughs> I'm going to come get you. You live on Staten Island. David Ben Ellie. <laughs> Affir <laughs> Affirmative. <laughs> Gosh. Tim Stiles. In favor. Mark Cantor. In favor. Thanks. Um, Robert Krupe. In favor. Arthur Cooper. In favor. Thank you. It's unanimously approved. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's move on to the next protocol, Dr. Lai. Great. Uh, the next protocol that we have up is going to be our excited delirium protocol. Um, there were a few changes that were made from this uh, when compared to our current unified protocols that I'll hopefully be able to, uh, to highlight uh, here for you guys, but hopefully you'll, you have all had the chance to uh, review this protocol. Um, there, there was just some uh, wordsmithing that was changed for the CFR uh, level, um, but otherwise, for the most part, this has, has uh, remained the same um, for here. The EMT section, again, nothing, uh, nothing too radical that has changed in the EMT section. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. For the, for the one thing that we do want to emphasize, though, that this has been changed now to just to be an adult uh, protocol that you'll see like on the top 
uh, heading. And then for the rest of the, uh, for the protocols, you'll see how we address this issue with uh, potential for pediatric patients uh, that we have discussed with uh, Matt Harris that I will get to once we uh, get to that section. Um, so you'll see now, um, this is a lot of this is to kind of address like some of the uh, issues that we have with the uh, current protocols um, with sort of the, uh, the chemical sedation and some of those issues that were um, kind of highlighted from before that we had to change some of the current wording of our protocol. But now for the paramedic section, uh, this is for adult patients, again, that are emphasized, uh, who are persistently agitated or, and present a risk of physical harm to providers, public or to the self that uh, providers may administer midazolam up to 10 milligrams IMIN or midazolam up to five milligrams IV, uh, where IM intramuscular is the preferred route of administration if intravascular access has not been established. So again, I think that this addresses an issue that commonly comes up with uh, many of our providers and that if they already have an IV access established uh, for those patients who may not have initially presented uh, as being uh, in excited delirium and that they were able to get an IV access for, for those patients that they can then administer midazolam understanding orders via the IV route if they do have that already established. Um, so that's where this is the main change that we have under the standing orders uh, for this. Uh, in addition, uh, the medical control options for the other benz benzodiazepines as well as for ketamine uh, has not changed uh, from the uh, previous protocol, um, and those have uh, remained the same. In terms of the issue for the potential for pediatric patients, um, I know that Matt Harris is not on the line here, um, but we did have a discussion about this during the protocol committee meeting uh, where he has uh, he was able to bring up to us that for pediatric patients, this is a very uh, rare instance for, pa uh, for pediatric patients to be truly uh, have uh, excited delirium and therefore to really kind of truly fall under these protocols. So for those instances where we do have a, for the rare occasions that um, our providers are going to be dealing with a pediatric patient with excited delirium, we, we would just recommend that they would then uh, contact online medical control for dosing uh, for um, that as needed uh, for those very rare instances again. But I think that this kind of um, helps us with sort of a you know, potential safety issue that I think a lot of us may feel uncomfortable with uh, when dealing with pediatric patients and giving benzodiazepines or ketamine uh, to these patients uh, without any sort of contact with, uh, with a physician or the medical control. Under the key points and considerations, we've also added language in here that is going to be consistent with the state um, that uh, for our providers to consider monitoring the patient using non-invasive capnography if available uh, when, whenever they're using any of the above medications uh, that causes sedative properties um, for it. But otherwise, the other key points and considerations are ones that, um, that have been in here since the uh, current protocol. Excellent. Um any discussion with regard to this protocol? Yeah, th this is Nick. I just wanted to uh, clarify something on the paramedics dosing over here. Um, so the way it reads, we're leaving it up to the discretion of the paramedics up to how much they want to give up to a maximum of 10 of Versed or five IV of Versed. So I just want to clarify that this is a, this, we're leaving the discretion up to the paramedic. It's no longer a standard dose. Yes, that's correct, Nick. So that, that was the intent of this protocol because uh, um, there were many uh, people um, on the protocol committee that had voiced the um, potential safety issue for a lot of these patients because, I mean, we have to admit that, you know, it is very difficult a lot of times to truly um, be able to, you know, if you will, kind of like diagnose that, that this patient is truly an excited delirium versus we all know that those patients where we have like an elderly patient who is, who is just, you know, severely agitated um, that made that pro a provider might feel that it would be falling under these protocols. So this is sort of so as, as a sort of like as a safety net, if we will, so that we'll have that, it'll be up to the discretion of the provider to give up to 10 milligrams um, or up to five milligrams IV to try and help with a lot of that discussion that happened during the protocol committee. And I think there's also like a lot of discussion that was previously in this, uh, during this REMAC uh, meetings as well before in the past. No, that, that's fine. I just want to make sure because we have been tracking how the administrations have been going and there have been many errors in uh, the administration not being given the correct way. So I just want to clarify that this is a, this is a uh, discretionary call on the paramedic side. <laughs> 
That's all. Excellent. Yeah. Any further? I'm sorry. Yeah. Any further Ms. discussion? Dario. I'm sorry, Dario. Yes, Dario. Pam. Sure. Uh, I said that we had the CFRs assisting the police if necessary. Did we talk anything about position uh, relative, like the uh, prone position? Yeah, so that's, uh, um, thanks for uh, bringing that up, Darius. So we actually have that in the uh, key points uh, section right here, that patient must not be transported in a prone or face down position. Perfect. Thank you. I, I'm trying to catch it, but I missed it. But thank you very much. No problem. All right. Excellent. Can I have a quick yes. question? Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Yes, Kevin. Yes, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question from the protocol committee. Is the interpretation of the general sense that um, if they were to choose a dose of, let's say, five milligrams of midazolam, that they would need to call for med control for a second dose so that they have the discretion to give up to 10. And if they wanted to make it in increments, they have that discretion as well. I think for here, the, the intent is that they it may be able to administer up to whatever the maximum dose is. Um, and it is going to be there, there. There is an or that we can make that a little bit bigger so that we, we can uh, emphasize that, that the, uh, it's going to be either midazolam, 10 milligrams IM, IN, or midazolam up to 5 milligrams IV. Anything Hello? further? Anyone else? Yes, yes. Tony Challenge. One second. Yes, Dr. Challenge, go ahead. It's hey, hard what? for me to see. Well, she wants to clean up the... <laughs> Guys, sure, whoever's not talking, move. please mute. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Shalish. Yeah. Um, under the key points, um, being that there's multiple uh, online control facilities and multiple docs and, and it'd be a rare instance for the PEDS, I think that's more and more reason to put a range in there instead of just key points. Uh, pediatric patients who are persistently agitated. Uh, just some kind of range of, of you know, because we don't we want to limit the variants and outliers. And uh, since this is rare to begin with and there's multiple people multiple sites, I think we should put a, a range in. I feel more comfortable with a range, especially in sedating children. Uh, so again, like that, I, so I think that um, the intent from the uh, protocol committee was that uh, they will be already in discussion with, you know, for those rare instances, just as you said, uh, they'll be in, uh, in discussion with the physician so that the physician will be able to then guide, you know, weight-based dosing or, or whatever that physician would deem to be appropriate for that specific situation for the uh, age as well as like the weight of that, of that child. I meant to decrease doctor. the variance for the doctor. I, I'm not sure the, it's to decrease the variance for the doctor. Since it's a rare occurrence and there's multiple doctors on multiple sites, uh, that's all the more reason to, I would think to put it for safety issues to put a I'm not Range sure the for the pediatric patients for that. For that. Dose, though. No. I'm sorry, Jeff. I what say I'm not saying? sure a physician on the other end, the, the protocols, what they would use to determine their dosing for peds, right? It's a physician right. decision we're talking about. I mean, it really is doctor dependent. We did discuss with this with Dr. Harris, and he was comfortable with this wording, and he's a uh, you know, PGM doctor. Looks like Paul has his hand raised. And yeah, I mean. Okay. The way I read it, it's almost like this is like a softly written discretionary order. You know, I mean, it's a rare situation. Uh, it, it, it's definitely going to be something that writing something down might actually create harm. And we should leave this as an ad hoc, make a good medical decision in the situation decision. Okay. Um... So is anyone making a motion to change this or is there, is there any motion on the table? Because otherwise I, I, I understand everyone concern, everyone's concerns, but uh, I think that this is kind of the uh, best we were able to uh, draft this and write this uh, at the protocol committee. Um, I, I do agree. a motion to vote to pass it as written. Who is that? Uh, Reed Caldwell, I vote, I vote, I motion to, to vote as is, as written. Second. Okay. Um, okay. So there, so do we have to, is there any further, I know we have to vote on whether on the motion to vote, uh, but um, if we David, want to be completely Jason, correct. Zimmerman. Yes, Jason. Uh, David. So before you go on the motion, although a motion's made, um, for further discussion, as I think Mike or Kevin just brought up, if you have the discretion to give a multiple dose of a benzo under a sort of standing order, does there have to be a key point or an education to how 
long you should wait in between the frequency of those two doses? Or are we allowing the medic to give four milligrams and then three minutes later when the patient's not sedated, give another six milligrams because it's up to 10? Well, I, well, I think that's I, a good that question. And that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a training uh, issue more than anything, Jason. You know, to, to understand that you don't, to, you should not expect something to change within three minutes, right? Yeah, but that's unfortunately the reality of all the medical controls are for medical control options are I gave 10 of verse at IM 60 seconds ago and the patient's still trying to hit the cop. What do I do? Yeah, but I think this is what the intent was from the beginning. I mean, this is what we brought up, let's say, uh, before it was a standard dose period. And then you had called medical control or for a discretionary order. Now you're allowing that discretion on the low level because that's where a lot of errors were. A lot of people were administering a, a lower dose in, as a precautionary measure. Uh, so now we're allowing up to that 10 milligrams or that five milligrams IV. And, and I think what would clarify it a little bit more perhaps is just uh, highlighting up to on both, on both of these statements, up to 10 milligrams or up to five, five milligrams might be helpful in distinguishing this, but we're not giving more than we were giving before. I know, but I'm afraid of two things. I'm afraid that one, um, maybe a medic who's uncomfortable with the administration of a benzo will want to give two milligrams and then the patient of course is not sedated and then give another two milligrams and we're 10 minutes in and the patient's still a present harm to themselves and others. Or, um, you know, we might just throw away, the, I know the max dose is still what we had before and I'm all for that on the safe appropriate dosing. Um, it just, you might end up with five administrations of two milligrams of Versed for 30 minutes trying to sedate a patient. You said 30 that's milligrams? How, how, no, no, 30 no, minutes. 30, 30 minutes. minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, that's the flip side of this, uh, of this way, but right. I don't think that we would, that we would encounter that. I mean, uh, okay. I think I guess, that's right. Yeah. So the education and training would be, listen, it is titratable and you don't have to go to the max dose but use the most appropriate weight-based dose for the appropriate situation is going to be a very key clinical education point. I agree. Uh, Dr. Lobel, you have your hand up. I don't know if you see him. Dave Lobel and Paul have their yes. hands. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Shalish in, in terms of uh, one of the things that we kind of had wanted to do in revising the protocols was to use milligram per kilogram dosing. And we don't have that here. So in terms of like getting, getting that situation where what, what we've set up here is that this is not a medical control option. This is a discretionary order because we don't have a specific dose in place. Um, and that really leaves our pediatric population um, either getting uh, docs. And there's, again, there's a lot of docs at a lot of facilities who are scratching their head saying, what's the pediatric dose? Um, you know, either we're going to delay care because somebody's going to say, oh, somebody run over the PTR and ask them what we should do. Or, uh, or they're going to say, well, I usually use two milligrams, but, you know, the, how big's the kid? And, you know, I, I think it would be good to have some guidelines or a reference for pediatric dosing for these medications, even if it's in the appendices or something. Um, uh, and just with regard to, um, uh, you know, how people dose things, you know, the, the, uh, my experience with, you know, picking up this phone this many times, or actually listening to other people pick up the phone because I review all the calls is that the medics judging on how violent the, the patient is decide already in their head, what they're going to do. And as they're administering the first dose of midazolam, they're already on the phone calling for the next dose, uh, because they don't think the 10 is going to be enough. Um, so, you know, definitely there's going to be a little bit of that. Um, but my main concern with the protocol as it stands is, is just to have some guidelines for pediatric dosing, um, mostly because like uh, I think we've all pretty much expressed, it's a rare event. Um, I can't remember my last pediatric shift and I don't have pediatric benzo dosing off of the head, off of, on the top of my head. Somebody's on the phone asking for an order. That's not really a great time for me to be looking through my references to try and find out what dose of a benzo I want to give to a child. Understood. So there are three more people that have their hands raised, and that's uh, Paul, Barbara, and uh, Reed. And afterwards, I think we have to vote on this motion that's on the table to vote for this as is. So go, go ahead, Dr. Bar uh, Dr. Barbara. 
So Matt, ha Matt Harris is here. Uh, if he wants to weigh in, but um, if it has this much consternation, maybe we should just take it back to protocol. I agree. Let's just hear what Matt Harris has to say. Dr. Harris? My apologies. I didn't get an invite for the meeting. Um, I, I, I missed the last few minutes. So if you want to review for me what you guys went over, I, I'm trying to pick so up. The, the, con the concern is with regard to the uh, key points um, and the um, some people feel that there needs to be pediatric, some sort of uh, range or reference to pediatric dosing for uh, uh, pediatric uh, excited delirium patients. Using ketamine exclusively no. or using what medications? Mm -hmm. yeah. No! That's a very good, uh, well, that's a very good question. We have options over here. Ketamine, midazolam, Whether diazepam. Ketamine or, or benzos, I'm not sure that the, our average online medical control physician um, has uh, pediatric dosing for any of those meds right off the top of their head. Correct. Um, so, you know, I, I think the issue, let me just step away for a second. I think the issue of excited delirium in children um, is really broken into two groups, right? It's excited delirium in, in young kids, which is almost, um, almost never encountered. And then it's adolescents who basically treat as adults, right? Um, and I think the dosing for, you know, some angry 15 year old is gonna be the same as the dosing for adults. I think if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to have to go back and give you a better evidence-based answer. I apologize. I wasn't aware we were discussing this today. Um, but I can come back to this group with a better evidence-based answer. Okay. So uh, I think in view of this, uh, perhaps you should, uh, um, I know that there's a motion to vote. Let's, let's just go to the, um, to the uh, Roberts uh, rules. And there was, a, there's a motion to vote as is on the, uh, um, on this protocol to vote it as is. Um, afterwards, we can vote on a motion to uh, to send us back to protocol. No, the other way um, around. The other way around. If you want to send it to pro back to protocol, that goes first. You, someone says, I wish to refer this back to committee. That vote goes now. Once you vote to accept the protocol, it's done. There's nothing to send back to anybody. Very Move good. to table. Move to table. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. I okay. Well done, Doctor. I, if I may correct Dr. Cooper, I believe he is moving to send it back to the table right. that puts it indefinitely on the table until someone moves it off. Yeah. You want to send it back to protocol. Nothing's going to happen if you table it. Right. No, I, that's what I meant. Thank you, you I did, uh, uh, Table to protocol to come back. Right. Thank you. Refer Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, does I anyone in the, does, very good, thank you. Does, is anyone on the uh, Medical Standards Committee opposed to the motion to, to move the, to send us back to protocol for review of the pediatric dosing? Okay, hearing none, uh, the, uh, this protocol is not being brought to REMAC uh, and I'm sure that the uh, protocol committee will bring it back next uh, in April. Let's move on to the next protocol, please. All right, just give me one. Second, um, let's see, so I think, okay, so for the next protocols, let's go over our environmental emergencies. So that's gonna be both for the uh, heat and cold emergencies. Um, so for the first one that we have up here is for cold emergencies for both adult and pediatric. Um, a lot of this was uh, language changing uh, or uh, just to uh, clarify for a lot of the um, for a lot of the, uh, excuse me, a lot of the orders that are, that are here, uh, as well as for the uh, CFR, uh, as well as uh, for definitions for both the localized cold injury versus uh, treatment for generalized hypothermia. Um, but otherwise, uh, nothing too much, nothing really has changed in terms of uh, what is, uh, or what was originally presented here in our unified protocols. Um, for the EMT section, um, this again has uh, not really changed. It's, a, it's in regards to that if the patient has altered mentor status that we do ask that our providers to measure and obtain a blood glucose level and treat appropriately as needed, as well as to request ALS assistance. Uh, for the paramedic section, um, we, would, we would like to have our providers uh, to provide advanced airway management if needed, uh, begin cardiac monitoring, obtain intravascular access, and then administer crystalloid fluid warmed if available, weight-based dosing, 20 mL per kilogram to a maximum of two liters. And again, these key points and considerations have not changed from the uh, previous protocol, or current protocol, Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Lai. Any discussion with regard to this protocol? 
Okay, hearing none, um, is there anyone on the Medical Standards Committee who wishes to oppose or abstain from moving this protocol forward a second in motion to remap? Okay, hearing none, uh, Marie, let's do a roll call, please, for approval uh, for REMAC members. Marie? Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, Robert Winchell? Approve. Okay, Nick Alexandru? Yes, in favor. Kevin Munjal? In favor. Cindy Basilios? In favor. Dario Gonzalez? In favor. Glenn Seda? Yes. Doug Isaacs? In favor. Nathan Reisman? In favor. Jeffrey Raybridge? In favor, thank you. Getting better. Reed Caldwell? In favor. Louis Marshall? In favor. Thank you. Michael Redliner? In favor. Wallace Carter? In favor. Laura I, I have a coli. I'll get in better. Favor. <laughs> in getting, favor. Getting better. Peter Wire? <laughs> yes. Paul Barbara? In favor. David Benelli? In favor. Tim Stiles? In Mark Cantor? In favor. Matthew Harris? In favor. Robert Krupe? In favor. Arthur Cooper? In favor. Thank you, passes unanimously. Excellent, thank you. So Dr. Lai, let's move on to the next protocol, please. Sure, uh, let's see. So the next protocol that we, oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I bring up the wrong version? Here we go. I think I might have. Hold on for just a minute. A little technical difficulty. Um, bum, 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 bum. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I mistakenly uh, passed over heat emergencies. I'm sorry about that, but we, but uh, I have caught my mistake. So we'll quickly go over uh, heat emergencies uh, as well. So again, just like its counterpart protocol for the cold emergencies, a lot of it was just a lot of uh, wordsmithing on here and not any true um, like medical or clinical changes were made to this protocol. Again, the CFR section has remained uh, the same. Um, EMT protocol, again, is, is uh, very similar in that if the patient has altered mental status, they're going to obtain the blood glucose level, treat, uh, and request for ALS assistance. Um, this has pretty much remained, the, this is essentially uh, has remained the same uh, from our current uh, unified protocols. Um, for the paramedic section, they are to obtain intravascular access and then to administer crystalloid fluid, weight-based dosing, 20 ml per kilogram IV, maximum of two liters. Key points and considerations, again, for this protocol has not really changed uh, in terms of uh, treating for the uh, patient with a uh, heat emergency. Very good. Um, any discussion with regard to this protocol? Very good. Um, so let's, uh, is there anyone on medical standards who opposes or abstains or wants to make changes to this protocol? Very good. So uh, this you protocol know. moves uh, from medical standards as a signal in motion to REMAC for approval. Marie, please do the roll call for the heat emergencies. Okay. Robert Winchell. Approve. Nick Alexandru? Yes. Kevin Munjal? Approved. Cindy Basilios? Approved. Dario Gonzalez? Dario? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Glenda Seda? Yes. Doug Isaacs? In favor. Nathan Reisman? In favor. Jeffrey Raybridge. In favor. Reed Caldwell. In favor. Lewis Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. In favor. Wallace Carter. In favor. Laura 
I have a Coley. In Laura? favor. Thank you. In Peter Wire. In favor. Paul Barbara. Paul Barbara. In favor. Sorry. In favor. That's okay. David Benelli. Yes. Uh, Tim Stiles. In favor. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. In favor. Robert Krupe. In favor. Arthur Cooper. In favor. Carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lai, let's move to the next protocol, please. All right, so we will be moving to decompression sickness. Uh, so this is a protocol that was renamed from our original um, unified protocols where it was originally drowning and uh, decompression, uh, drowning and uh, decompression uh, patients. This is now just the renamed to be a uh, decompression sickness uh, as it was uh, felt from the committee that uh, in terms of uh, for the drowning patient, there was not anything that is not already covered in another protocol, but decompression sickness was something that was still unique enough, even though that there are not uh, many uh, patients uh, that may uh, be treated under this protocol, but it was felt that it was still uh, something that was uh, significant enough that uh, we should uh, have uh, keep this uh, as a protocol uh, moving forward with our rewrite. Uh, so again, there are there are some uh, changes from this uh, from the uh, current unified protocols. The CFR section has, has uh, remained the same uh, in terms of uh, for their airway management and for these patients that they will all be at the administered oxygen. Uh, for the EMT section, uh, patients will be transported if they have any of the following signs and symptoms of decompression sickness after diving, as well as their companion divers. Uh, they will be uh, transported to the closest hyperbaric center with a listing of common uh, ailments uh, from uh, decompression sickness. Uh, there is nothing much uh, to add in terms of the uh, paramedic section uh, for this protocol. Um, however, the key points have been added in terms of some additional things that we would like to have our providers to uh, document and to make note of, including uh, to, be, uh, to bring the patient's dive computer or dive watch, uh, if that is available, to bring that to the hospital to obtain some of the specific information about the dives, as well as uh, knowing uh, some information, including maximum depth, total time spent underwater, the bottom time, the time of ascension to the surface, uh, as well as uh, any, uh, what the uh, compressed gases were used during the dive, any uh, improvement of the symptoms since ascension to the surface, and as well as the uh, time since the last dive was completed and any air travel history uh, that was done uh, since the, uh, the last dive that was performed. Thank you very much. Uh, this was on purpose kept as simple as possible, uh, uh, CFR BLS level protocol. Any discussion with regard to this protocol? Uh, somebody has something to say. <laughs> uh, hearing none other than the board. Um, um, is there anyone on medical standards who opposes, abstains, or wishes to change this protocol? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, this protocol moves a second motion to REMAC. Marie, uh, please do a roll. Any discussion from anyone from REMAC? Otherwise, let's do uh, a roll call, please, Marie, for decompression sickness. <clears throat> Marie? Sorry, I put myself on mute because of the dog, but here we go. <laughs> Dr. Winchell? Approve. Nick Alexandru? Yes, in favor. Kevin Mundral? Approve. Cindy Basilios? Approve. Dario Gonzalez? Approved. Lena Seda? Yes. Doug Isaacs? In favor. Nathan Reisman? In favor. Jeffrey Raybridge? In favor. Reed Caldwell? In favor. Lewis Marshall? In favor. Michael Redliner. I am in favor. Wallace Carter. In favor. Laura Ivacoli. In Laura? favor. Thank in you. Favor. 
Peter Weyer? Yes. Paul Barbara? Yes. David Benelli? Yes. Tim Stiles? In favor. Mark Cantor? In favor. Matthew Harris? In favor. Robert Krupe? In favor. And Arthur Cooper? In favor. And it carries unanimously. Thank you. Let's move on to the next protocol. Great. Um, let's see. All right. So we'll go to poisoning uh, next. Let me just move up to the top. Uh, so poisoning protocol, uh, this essentially like a lot of it is not really, um, there's not really a whole lot of uh, true, um, I guess, like medicine, if you will, uh, that's associated with this protocol, uh, at least on the surface for the CFR and the EMT levels. Uh, we will get to like uh, some changes uh, that were there in terms of plans shifting of some of the uh, medical control options versus standing orders for the paramedic section that we'll get to in just a second. Uh, in terms of for the uh, the changes that were made to the CFR level, uh, these uh, if the first few points have all uh, remained the same. We do have a reference that uh, if the patient has a suspected opiate overdose, uh, they would they would be treating appropriately as as needed under the uh, overdose protocol that we will discuss right after this. The other part that was um, that was changed uh, from this um, is that for these uh, special considerations um, for, in particular, for the uh, envenomation uh, instances uh, that we have moved from the EMT level to now to be in the CFR level, uh, that we do not want providers to be uh, attempting uh, in any means to be able to try and capture the envenom envenomating uh, animal or attempt to remove the venom. Um, and also that we wanted them to be able to assess for signs of anaphylaxis and then treat as needed uh, under the CFR level. The other thing that was changed, there was like just some wordsmithing in terms of the uh, insect stings as well as the uh, snake bites under here, but it was also moved that, um, that, that for uh, marine animals that this was uh, sort of like the, uh, the uh, protocols, uh, if you will, in terms of uh, potentially removing any bristles, uh, removing the spine, and then covering with sterile dressing. This was moved from the EMT section to the CFR section, uh, as it was just felt that there was nothing that, was, uh, that would necessarily require a higher level of medical provider that CFRs would be able to uh, treat for this appropriately uh, with, their, uh, with their training. Uh, in terms of for the uh, EMT level, um, this has uh, just pretty much remained the same uh, just with uh, just for the wording that if the patient again has altered mental status that they obtain the blood glucose level treat uh, and request ALS assistance uh, in terms of for the special considerations for the EMTs that uh, if they do have a they're able to measure carbon monoxide levels they should be taking that into consideration for any sort of inhalation uh, poisoning um, and then for envenomation that they should request for ALS assistance, but again, to not delay uh, transport to wait for ALS um, for this. Uh, in terms of the uh, paramedic section, uh, they are just to uh, perform advanced airway management if needed, obtain intravascular access, and then begin cardiac monitoring. Um, but otherwise, um, and then the, uh, the key points and considerations, um, a lot of this was, uh, was um, just sort of um, kind of depending on what the substance was, there is some overlap between some of the key points from here as well as from the, uh, the overdose protocol. But again, a lot of this is uh, similar to what our current unified protocol is for poisoning. Very good. Any discussion regarding this protocol? And I think for uh, purposes of uh, um, efficiency, anyone from medical standards or remap? Okay, hearing none. Is there anyone on medical standards who objects, uh, opposes, or um, or abstains uh, with uh, removing this protocol with moving this protocol forward a second motion to remap? Okay, hearing none. Um, uh, is there any anyone on remap who wishes to discuss this protocol further? Very good, Marie, the lady with the sunflower. Can we uh, <laughs> do a roll call for this protocol? Sure. Okay, uh, Robert Winchell? Approved. Nick Alexandru? Approved. Kevin Munjal? Approved. 
Cindy Basilios. Approved. Dario Gonzalez. Approved. Glenna Seda. Yes. Doug Isaacs. In favor. Nathan Reisman. Yes, approved. Jeffrey Raybridge. Approved. Reed Caldwell. In favor. Lou Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. I'm in favor. Wallace Carter. In favor. Laura Ivacoli. In favor. Peter Wire. Yes. Paul Barbara. In favor. David Benelli. In favor. Tim Stiles. In favor. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. Matthew Harris. In favor. Robert Krupe. In favor. And Arthur Cooper. In favor. Carries unanimously. Very good, thank you. Dr. Lydie, next protocol. All right, We're getting great. there. Uh, only uh, three more left. So oh the next one is going to be uh, the overdose protocol. Um, so again, this is a, a uh, adult and pediatric protocol. So again, nothing was essentially changed in terms of like the dosing for the, uh, for the naloxone, um, but it's just, it's just with a slightly different format with the adult and the pediatrics into the uh, one protocol here. So again, for our CFRs, uh, they are to provide airway management, appropriate oxygen, and then to administer you know, the uh, naloxone for the adult as well as then for the pediatric, same dosing as, as what was uh, in our current protocols. Um, so uh, for the uh, EMT section, so again, we, we do request them that they obtain a blood glucose level and treat. And then if, and then if, they, if they are also under the assumption that the uh, patient is opioid overdose is suspected um, and the patient is still symptomatic, um, that we want them to be administering naloxone again. One thing that I do want to mention, though, that is a change from the protocol is just to, quickly, just as a remi reminder to myself, that the wording has changed that right now in terms of uh, patients to fit the criteria to be given naloxone, uh, we have removed the, um, the uh, respiratory rate of less than 10 uh, because if there was some discussion that, that, um, that a lot of times it, it would just be patients who are going to be symptomatic who do have inad for a inadequate respiratory rate that these patients and with a high suspicion of having an opioid overdose that they should fall under these protocols. So the wording is for that if the opioid overdose is suspected and the patient's respiratory rate is inadequate, uh, that they would be administering the naloxone. Um, for the paramedic section, they are able to titrate the naloxone, um, that they have uh, in, um, titrate the naloxone up to the uh, four milligrams IV IM IN in 0 0.5 milligram increments. Uh, that has not changed. Um, that again for the adult and then also to uh, titrate the naloxone uh, dosing for the pediatrics as well, depending on the age uh, for the maximum dosing. Uh, we have included on here understanding orders that for symptomatic patients with a suspected cardiac medication overdose, that they should be uh, treating accordingly as needed. So this again, will be referring to um, any of our uh, dysrhythmia protocols if they need to, uh, that they will, uh, they will be kind of falling under those protocols for, for patients with, a, with their symptomatic and then who have a suspected cardiac medication overdose. There are some specific uh, overdoses that we want to address uh, that, that is uh, consistent with uh, current uh, state as well as our unified protocols that are falling under medical control options as it was kind of thought that um, it would benefit providers to kind of to discuss uh, some of these uh, treatments with a physician prior to giving them just to get a little bit more of a, um, mm. um, a higher level discussion for some of these uh, treat, uh, excuse me, for some of these uh, symptoms, uh, symptoms that they might be, ex they might be experiencing with the patients that they are treating. So for, for some of those, so for dystonic reactions, uh, patients would be able to administer diphenylhydramine or Benadryl. Uh, if they are suspected of having uh, any sort of um, uh, QTC prolongation from antidepressant medications, uh, they, are, they are able to administer sodium bicarbonate. And then again, for, for any sort of uh, simple mimetic overdose, so that would be including cocaine as well as any amphetamines, 
that um, it, they are given uh, weight-based options for benzodiazepines uh, on here. And we have the uh, range of the benzodiazepines that are listed here. Um, again, otherwise, in terms of like for the uh, key points and considerations that we do request that uh, providers uh, to be able to uh, document and name the substance, the amount taken and the time of duration of the exposure, as well as to be able to try and obtain information from the product uh, from the product container labor, or if possible, to bring that product in its container with the patient uh, to the hospital. And again, it's sort of spelled out here that the CFRs and EMTs may administer a maximum of two naloxone doses as described in their respective protocol sections. Um, and then again, with the titratable dose for the paramedics up to the age appropriate uh, dosing uh, on here. And then we have also still kept here that uh, from our current unified protocols in terms of uh, the use of the, uh, the four milligram naloxone spray, uh, that that can take the place of the naloxone dosing in these protocols. And that, is, that has just uh, been a remnant uh, from our current protocols as this is still very uh, widely used uh, by, by, the, uh, by some providers. So. Hey, very good. Any discussion uh, with yeah. regard to this protocol? David, I have a question on this. Just, uh, sure. is there any chance or any reasoning why uh, Benadryl has to be a medical control option for dystonic reactions and not standard order, let's say, into the paramedics? It's fairly benign. Um, you know, the description is going to be what it is to the doctor. So I don't see uh, why diphenhydramine has to be a medical control option. Just, just asking. Can I answer? Yes, go ahead. I think it's because of concern for like a stroke-like syndrome and it could be a high, a high grade miss if we assume it's what it is. It's almost like a checkpoint. It's a good point. I mean, dy I mean dystonic reaction is really a diagnosis of exclusion in an ambulance. I mean, you know, someone has a rapid change in motor function in their face. The first thing we should be thinking about is not who gave them Reglan. So if it becomes something that comes up, we should be able to arm the paramedic with the ability to take care of the patient, but it is worth running it past someone, in my opinion. I, I it, Once you, it's a dystonic reaction, it's no joke, uh, absolutely give, put the power in their hands. But um, I think it's a situation that uh, has high-grade miss um, possibilities. Any further discussion? I well, think if you just give Benadryl and it takes care of the stonic reaction, then, then uh, you know, I think you can exclude stroke at that point. But if it's, if it sounds like it might be a stroke, we still got to evaluate it, but um, you know, stroke's not going to get better with, with uh, Benadryl. But would you want someone with a stroke getting a, uh, you know, like a, a therapeutic investigation with Benadryl first to see how long it takes to get them better? Now, I think that should be. I think. I think that should be part of the evaluation. I don't think we should be waiting one way or another. But we have, you know, very, very common situations where it's a dystonic reaction, especially from suspected antiemetic, antipsychotic, or antidepressant medications, is listed. So it's it's giving you a pretty clear cut uh, reasoning why they may have a dystonic reaction. Yeah, I think just to reemphasize just what. What Paul had said, I, I think that we just do not want to, I'm, I'm sorry, David, but I just think that we just do not want to delay um, any reason for that patient to potentially be transported to a, you know, stroke center, to an appropriate stroke center, uh, kind of waiting to see like if the Benadryl is going to solve like their, their motor function or not due to a potential dystonic reaction. I think that just having like that safety measure of just, just discussing it over with the physician, I, I don't think it necessarily uh, puts any harm uh, for our providers by having this as, as just as a safety measure, measure there. Ackerman had his hand up. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question on, is there a specific reason 15, 16, and 17 aren't in the poisoning and drug overdose protocol and put here? Rob, can I answer that one? Go so we made, a con we made a concerted effort um, to pull naloxone out of a altered mental status protocol. And by doing so, we diverged the 
environmental stuff into the um, poisoning and the uh, overdose into more the naloxone. Um, I know we still have some, it, it's really more, it's supposed to be one's more like the medicine end and one's more the other stuff end. Um, but really the goal was to get naloxone out of a mental status protocol because um, opiate overdoses are a breathing problem. Um, so we split the two. So it's one's for poisoning and one's for uh, overdose moving forward. Very good. Um, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. Um, is there anyone on medical standards who objects, opposes, or abstains from moving this protocol as is a second in motion to remac for approval? Okay, hearing none, is there anyone on remac who has any objections or wants to discuss this protocol? Very good, Marie. Let's uh, move with the roll call for this protocol, please. Okay, Dr. Winchell. Approved. Nick Alexandru. Yes. Kevin Munjal. Approved. Cindy Basilios. Approved. Dario Gonzalez. Approved. Lena Seda. In favor. Doug Isaac. In favor. Nathan Reisman. In favor. Jeffrey Raybridge. In favor. Reed Caldwell. In favor. Lou Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. Aye. Wallace Carter. Approved. Laura Avicoli. In favor. Peter Weyer. Approved. Paul Barbara. Approved. David Benelli. Yes. Tim Stiles. Approved. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. In favor. Robert Krupe. In favor. Art Cooper. In favor. Unanimously approved. Thank you very much, Dr. Light. Two more to go. Yes, two more to go. So the first one that we'll go through is going to be the adult non-traumatic cardiac arrest protocols. So again, this is for specifically for adults only. The pediatric protocol is still being uh, worked on. So hopefully by the next REMAC meeting, we'll, have, we'll go through the non-traumatic cardiac arrest for pediatric protocol, but this is only for adults. Uh, so again, so a lot of these, um, it, there was a concerted effort to try and remove like a lot of sort of like sub protocols with the, uh, with the cardiac arrest protocol. And then now just for the non-traumatic cardiac arrest to just have one singular protocol to kind of encompass uh, all uh, sort of like the, uh, all of the, um, the uh, potential patients uh, that would be, uh, would, that would be falling, that this would be uh, falling under, excuse me. So CFR, uh, CFR is uh, nothing has uh, changed in terms of uh, just a prompt AED placement, uh, as well as uh, as well as the uh, chest compressions uh, for here, as well as following the AED prompts um, as directed. EMTs are again to be requesting ALS assistance, but then are to uh, continue CPR and AED analysis with minimal interruption of chest compressions, uh, but then also to transport after a total of three cycles in CPR and AED analysis if that ALS is. ALS unit has not arrived uh, by that time. In terms of for the paramedic section, uh, so again, uh, if that AED was initially in place, they are to transition from the AED to it, the ALS monitor uh, um, uh, and begin cardiac monitoring. Um, as, as, as soon as they are there, they are to perform any sort of needle decompression for suspected tension pneumothorax as needed uh, for any potential cause for uh, PEA. Um, Afterwards, they are to obtain intravascular access and then administer uh, epinephrine uh, to repeat uh, as needed every three to five minutes until the patient achieves, achieves ROS. Afterwards, they are to perform advanced airway management uh, after the uh, second rhythm analysis, obtain blood glucose level and treat as needed. And then for those cases, for if the rhythm is in ventricular fibrillation or pulseless uh, VTAC, they are to administer the amiodarone bolus, the 300 milligrams IV, uh, and then if they are to still be on scene after 20 minutes of ALS treatment, they are to consider contacting uh, online medical control uh, for any medical control options as indicated or for termination of resuscitation. 
Medical control options, again, uh, have been uh, sort of consolidated under this uh, general medical non-traumatic cardiac arrest protocol. So the, we have the same in terms of uh, sodium bicarbonate administration, 44 to 88 milliequivalents IV um, cal- uh, for, and then the uh, calcium chloride, one gram IV administration of crystalloid fluids to a maximum of three liters. And then for uh, any sort of a recurring V-fib or pulseless VTAC, uh, the amiodarone 150 milligrams IV or the uh, magnesium sulfate 2 grams uh, IV. Um, otherwise, a lot of these uh, key points and considerations have uh, just sort of been in place um, since, uh, since the, uh, uh, excuse me, with our uh, current unified protocols. Let's do some research on Google. I'm like, that's not the answer I really want to hear, that I really should do some research. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Any discussion with regard to these protocols? Both for medical standards and REMAC, just to make it um, efficient. Hearing none, anyone on? David, I'm yes, sorry. go ahead. Was there any consideration for adding uh, a, a note about hypothermia um, in the setting of cardiac arrest, like the not using multiple doses of epinephrine or anything like that? I mean, it's a small. Hey, but uh, I wanted to get people's thoughts. Um, I do not believe that that was uh, discussed during the uh, the protocol committee. Um, although we we do have under for the um, uh, let's see, uh, what was it? Um, uh, under the uh, hypo, uh, excuse me, the cold emergencies protocol that we do have a key point on here for that patients with hypothermic immersion, they may revi- remain viable with uh, prolonged exposures just for the uh, potential f- to, uh, for continued resuscitation efforts for those patients. But we did not address in terms of specifically epinephrine with uh, hypothermic patients. Um, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. Um, is there anyone on medical standards who uh, objects or abstains uh, to moving this protocol to um, REMAC for approval? Very good. Um, hearing none, Marie, please do a roll call for okay. uh, REMAC members. Robert Winchell. Approve. Nick Alexandru. Yes, in favor. Kevin Munjal. Approve. Cindy Basilios. Approve. Dario Gonzalez. Approved. Doug Isaacs. In favor. Nathan Reisman. In favor. Jeffrey Raybridge. In favor. Reed Caldwell. In favor. Lewis Marshall. In favor. Michael Redliner. I'm in favor. Wallace Carter. In favor. Laura Ivacoli. In favor. Peter Weyer. Yes. Paul Barbara. Yes. David Benelli. Yes. Tim Stiles. In favor. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. In favor. Robert Krupe. In favor. Arthur Cooper. In favor. Carried unanimously. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lai. The last protocol for this evening. Okay. So the last protocol that we have is gonna be uh, for the sister protocol for traumatic cardiac arrest. So this is, keep, please keep in mind that this is a adult and pediatric protocol for the uh, traumatic cardiac arrest. Uh, so again, a lot of the, the language uh, mirrors that from the protocol that we had uh, just reviewed. So for CFRs, they're again to uh, place an AED and then to begin chest compressions and to follow the uh, voice prompts as indicated. There is an addition here that they are to control any bleeding as needed, again, without interrupting CPR for these uh, traumatic patients that may have any uh, issues with uh, hemorrhaging. Uh, EMT section, again, has uh, pretty much uh, remained the same, just in, except that uh, so the, uh, they are to uh, request ALS assistance. They are to continue the chest compressions as well as the AED analysis, but, it, but the emphasis here is that uh, they are to transport these patients uh, and then not necessarily be waiting for like a certain number of um, 
um, uh, resuscitation cycles or so forth for that. So that that's what we want to emphasize with the uh, traumatic cardiac arrest. Uh, for the paramedic section, so again, they are to they are to um, to, uh, uh, to minimize any sort of interruptions uh, with the chest compressions. Transition over to an ALS monitor um, if uh, when they're able to. And there, we do have a statement on here that if the cause of the cardiac arrest is suspected to be secondary to a medical condition that is not traumatic, that they are they are to treat accordingly as a non-traumatic cardiac arrest. So again, that they are to then reference back to the uh, to the previous protocol if there is a medical etiology for the patient to be under cardiac arrest. Um, otherwise, if uh, if not, if they're still following the tr the uh, trauma algorithm, they are to perform a neo decompression for any suspected tension pneumothorax as needed. Oh, I'm still in a perform call. advanced airway. Uh, perform advanced airway management. Um, and then um, guys, please uh, uh, mute yourself if you're not on the if you're not talk, talking, please. Sorry, Dr. Lai. No, that's okay. So obtain intravascular access with a large bore IV or intraosseous site. Um, again, uh, for the uh, consider intraosseous uh, access for pediatric patients uh, if needed to administer crystalloid fluid, weight-based dosing up to a maximum of two liters. Um, and then again, if they're still on scene for whatever reason that they're still on scene for after 20 minutes of ALS treatment, they are to contact online medical control for any, any uh, medical control options or termination of resuscitation. Uh, medical control options uh, have remained the same in terms of additional crystalloid fluid, weight-based dosing to a maximum of uh, one liter. And otherwise, the, the key points and considerations, again, have remained the same. Very good. Thank you. Any discussion regarding this protocol? Both from medical yeah, standards and from REMAC. Yes, yeah, who is I, it? Dr. Cooper. Go ahead, Art. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, given all the uh, emphasis on the stopping the bleeding uh, in trauma uh, 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 of late, uh, which is, of course, entirely appropriate, why would we want to put on the uh, you know, the ECG leads and pads and so on before we actually address exsanguinating external hemorrhage. It seemed to me that the addressing exsanguinating external hemorrhage should come, should come before placement of leads. No, absolutely, Art. And that's, and, and that's actually why we have uh, in the, under the CFR section, so that it's num, uh, number six of, oh, you, you mean to move the, the control external bleeding up higher. Is that what you mean? Yes, I mean, I would put it after number one, honestly. Makes sense. So, David, I think I, that Ben has I think, a comment, uh, I and I know Bob that he was uh, online one of as well, and he might want to comment. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I know Ben. I'll let you talk in one minute. What were you saying, Gard? No, no, I said, I said, I think Robert Winchell is online as well. Uh, I, he might want to comment. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Winchell, we'll give you one minute. Let me let Dr. Zaber talk first, and then uh, you're next. Okay. Uh, ben, go ahead. Sure. No, that sounds great. Thank you. Ben, Dr. Zawar? Okay. Can you, ben, you, um, you, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Yep, there you go. Now we can. All right, good. Uh, sorry. I, I think my the thinking was that if you have a patient who has life threatening, you're going to address right away, but you're going to be bleeding protocol. This protocol is more for you have a patient down in cardiac arrest. Um, so, you know, you're going to start with treating the cardiac arrest. Um, and I, I think my, the thinking for step six was more, you have a patient who's in arrest, but they also have an amputation from a subway car, you know, so you'd put a tourniquet on that. Um, but to, I, I agree with Dr. Cooper, but I think the idea is if you showed up and you saw life-threatening bleeding that you deal with on the bleeding protocol, not this protocol. And, and there it is prioritized ahead of everything else, basically. Dr. Winchell. Well, I, I can see the logic behind that. Um, it just, uh, with this, you know, to Art's point, if the patient's in arrest because they're lying in a pool of blood, the external hemorrhage really needs to be addressed if it's going to do much good. So, you know, I don't, I think it's reasonable if this is the traumatic arrest protocol, I might argue it makes some sense to bring it a little farther up just to make sure it's on people's minds. Because amazingly, sometimes it's not, even though it seems as it should be. Very good. Um, is there a motion to just move this a little forward? Uh, to, is there any further discussion on this? 
Yeah, as Dario, I have to agree. I think that the issue of these EKGs and trauma are really, you know, not, not indicated. And I, I see a lot of these delays where we're doing three leads on people that are shot and having other problems, even though it sounds impractical. I think, you know, the bleeding issue should be the number one thing and anything else can be done in the vehicle. So I'll move that we move uh, just, control any bleeding as needed without interrupting CPR uh, up to uh, number two. So between number one and number two is currently written. Okay. So we're not we're we're still leaving the AD, but we're just moving it one step down. Um, is there a second for that? Yeah, this is Robert Winchell. I'd second that. Excellent. Is there any further discussion on this? David, I just it, forgive me if we've discussed this in the past. I seem to remember some vague conversation, but with regard to transport. Have we had discussion about transporting these patients to a trauma center as opposed to the closest? I forgot what where the discussion ended up on that. I know in the past we've talked about. Okay, that. let's let's leave that. Hold off on that for one second. Okay, leave that for the. Uh, let's just. There's a motion on the table uh, that we have to approve, um, and then we'll move on to the with, with regard to the transport. Okay, um, so is there any further discussion regarding uh, changing the order and moving this? Uh, you know, stopping external hemorrhage higher up. How higher up? Be specific. To number two. Okay. Begin CPR. Yeah, that was my motion to move it to number two. Okay, hearing none, um, instead of uh, voting in favor or against, is there anyone who opposes this motion? Okay, very good. So, uh, Dr. Lai, you will... Uh, just update and move that higher up, correct? Okay, now with correct. regard to transport. Um, we, there has been discussion about this, as far as I recall. Um, and uh, I believe that we were supposed to reach out to RTAC about that. Um, and I don't know where we stand further from that. Yeah. Uh, I know, know we had that. discussed in the past and then I, so, I never heard yeah. anything else about it. So I'm not sure yeah. where it's at. So, I Doug, start, I, yeah, so uh, I've been trying to communicate with uh, uh, Dr. Prince, who chairs RTAC, to uh, bring it forth. This is one topic uh, amongst some of the other RTAC related uh, regarding uh, transporting patients in traumatic arrest, whether it's penetrating or blunt. Uh, and there's some other uh, topics for RTAC, such as uh, uh, the uh, traction device with open fracture and so on. So uh, I'm sure Dr. Winchell could talk about it and Dr. Cooper, um, but uh, I did reach out to uh, that prints, you know, to bring it up at, our, at the next RTAC meeting. Okay, so at this point, I, I believe we should just leave the, this protocol as is, and uh, if there's any change from RTAC, we can uh, update uh, later on. Um, any further discussion regarding this protocol? Both from uh, medical standards and REMAC members. Okay, hearing none, um, the girl with the sunflower moving to a roll call on this protocol. Okay, let me just make sure. Uh, this is as amended, right, David? As amended, that, that was already approved, as amended. Okay, uh, Robert Winchell. Approved. Nick Alexandru. Yes. Kevin Munjal. Approved. Cindy Basilios. Approved. Dario Gonzalez. Approved. Glenna Seda. In favor. Doug Isaacs. In favor. Nathan Reisman. Nathan? Maybe we can come back to him. Um, sure. Oh, Jeffrey here he is. I'm sorry? Yes, in favor. Thank you. Jeffrey Raybridge? In favor. Uh, Reed Caldwell? In favor. Lewis Marshall? In favor. Michael Redliner? In favor. Wallace Carter. Dr. In, fa in, in favor, Thank sorry. You. Thank you. Laura Ivacoli. In favor. Peter Wire. In favor. Paul Barbara. In favor. David Benelli. In favor. Tim Stiles. In favor. Mark Cantor. In favor. Matthew Harris. In favor. Robert Krupe. In favor. Art Cooper. In favor. Passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Dr. Lai, I believe that's the end of the protocol committee report. Um, and I the next have report that is, it is the end. <laughs> and I believe that the David? next protocol committee is meeting on, uh, just one second, on uh, the 19th of this month, correct? That, that is correct. 10 p.m. 10 a.m. Sorry. Da yes. Uh, who said David? 10 a.m. Yes. Anthony Shalish. Yes. Tony Shalish. Go ahead. I would just like, uh, thank, uh, like to thank Dr. Lai and the entire um, protocol committee for their work. It's very succinct, very good work, and uh, it's really showing, uh, um, it's moving things forward, and I'd like to thank her. I'm sure we all completely agree. Well, all of our collective efforts. Really Thank good. you very much. I think it's time to move to the uh, inter-facility protocol to Dr. Berkowitz, to his report. John, you should be around here somewhere. I am around here. Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, all right. So I will uh, be brief for the interest of uh, sanity and dinner. Um, so um, we met on the 11th, um, and we had a follow-up discussion to the, the, the uh, initial meeting. Um, in the interim, we did reach out to uh, several uh, of the, the, the two adjoining regions um, and made them aware and, and offered participation in this discussion, given the, the kind of the regional nature. Um, and uh, we uh, went through some of the same issues um, and some of the same discussions, um, but really focused on a couple of key uh, a, a key, a couple of key areas that we didn't spend as much time in the first meeting. Um, first of all, we spent a lot of time talking about um, uh, training and education, um, uh, and uh, and a fair amount of time talking about um, uh, uh, taxonomy or some uh, uh, or kind of the, some of the language that we might use when we build this. Um, and we also spoke uh, ad additionally on. Um, credentialing. Um, uh, we've gathered a couple of references for folks to look at, um, uh, including the uh, the 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 um, the old uh, New York City interfacility protocols, as well as uh, that that Finger Lakes document. And there's also something similar from the Western region as well of New York um, and. Uh, the next, uh, part, the next uh, plan is really to build an outline of what we want this to look like. Um, I think there's general consensus that to focus more on the minimal standards part and less to focus on kind of a protocol in the traditional sense. Um, and uh, so uh, what the plan right now is, um, I'm gonna compile the, all the information from the past, uh, from the past two meetings put it together in, in a succinct outline, share it with the participants of the, of the, of the two tags, meetings that we've had, um, and see if we can get agreement that the outline, uh, it, when, when that document is fleshed out, that that, that, that suits our needs, um, and then we can go from there. The next meeting, um, I think that in order to, to, to get all that together, um, I think the next meeting that we would have would be uh, uh, not this, um, uh, would be uh, April 8th at 1 p.m. Uh, we were talking about doing it uh, Thursdays, the, the second Thursday at 1, um, but it will probably take uh, a few more weeks to truly pull all the, all the, all the notes I have and uh, some of the other references together and build that outline. Um, and, then, and then that will be that will be the blueprint for moving forward. Um, any thoughts, questions, or issues? Okay. Any discussion with regarding to the interfacility transfer transport protocol report? Okay, if not, um, thank you very much. I mean, I think we're moving forward. Uh, we're doing something that we have, we're finally doing something that we have to, we had to be doing for a long time already. Right. So thank you very much. And uh, no we look forward to uh, your continue, continuous work on this. Um, okay, so I think that's the end of the uh, subcommittee reports. Um, now, uh, I don't think we have any unfinished business. Um, is there any new business that anyone wishes to bring up? Two medical the standards. Unfinished business is the bylaws. Yeah, Why? we're going to go back to. No, no, that's that's going to. We're going to. We're closing. Standard. I'm closing the medical standards. Okay. Is there any medical standards? New business.
Okay, hearing none, I believe we can adjourn uh, medical standards and now move to the um, to the uh, REMAC section yes. of this meeting. So thank you will, very much. We will resume. Thank you. Myself. We will resume the uh, REMAC agenda with the QA report. Dr. Redliner, anything for QA? You know, the QA, um, uh, the QA uh, committee did not meet between then and now. Um, I think we, we got sidetracked by all of the, the REMAC responsibilities in the region, which I applaud um, uh, Joe and Marie for leading. Um, I, I do want to share one, uh, the dashboard, uh, just for a moment about the stroke and the STEMI stuff that we've been working on with the American Heart Association. It's a sketch, uh, but it has real data, and I just want to share it briefly. Um, so give me one second and I will, um, I will do that. Um, let's see, sorry, I apologize, just one second. Okay, um, so this, uh, what you see in front of you is the initial- oh, We don't see anything, you haven't- I don't anything. see anything. All right, all right, okay. Here again, all come right. on, Red Leonard. <laughs> Mike, I don't see anything. Now, there you, you go. Anything? Open your yeah. eyes. I have a motion for you to show me something, Michael. Now, can you see anything? Yes. Second. Who seconded my motion? Okay, good. I, I don't, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, listen, this is, this is a work in progress. And as you know, we've been working on this for some time now. Um, this is the, one of the first versions that we've seen with real data from the region. It's the aggregate data, um, and it's, it's focused on... The, the two elements from a uh, mission lifeline, stroke and STEMI. So what we see here is, is um, really the first phase and it is um, looking at our regional performance around what, when and where we perf uh, perform the New York City SLAMS score, uh, documenting last known well, our blood glu glu glucose checks uh, for our stroke patients and whether or not we have the appropriate stroke destination. This is specifically for our uh, our um, uh, our uh, minor strokes and for their, you know, making sure that they get to a primary stroke center. So I think one thing to note in this is that um, it's, if you want to look at one thing to highlight, it may be that as a region, we look at blood glucose as one of the interventions that we're doing while before we transport patients to the hospital. Um, and as we get telemetry data into the system, we'll have better, a better idea about these LVO transports and whatnot. And just the other piece of this is the on-scene time. Um, this is um, this on-scene time is 23 minutes for strokes, and uh, 911 call to destination time is 38 minutes. Now this is uh, just for 2021, um, and um, you know it's something that we're it's a it's a landmark, and we'll have to look at it going forward. Um, this is um, the STEMI stuff that's similar. Um, one, I would highlight uh, that this is the chest pain contact to 12 lead of less than or equal to 10 minutes is something that we as a region might want to work on. Um, we might see an improvement to get our EKGs done in our chest pain patients earlier. Um, and again, here is the on scene time and the 911 call to destination time. These are the two measures that we thought were, were um, applicable to the care and the speed of these, trans of these patients. So. Um, that's what I'd like to share. Um, and I think that we'll have more and more information as we move forward with the integration uh, of these uh, sources of data in our region. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Redliner? All right. Is there a training and ed report? Yeah, so training and ed met on um, March 5th, this past Friday. Um, there were several discussions had. Um, one was once again to get more instructor level uh, classes happening. Uh, there's some discussion about creating a more standard curriculum in the region. One of our biggest challenges is getting courses approved by the DOH. Uh, so Marie is going to be setting up a call for us with, uh, with Ryan Greenberg and with Gene Taylor so that we can uh, try and formalize that so that we can get these courses approved more readily and have a, um, a routine schedule set up for these classes so that there's some sort of cadence to it, especially for instructor update classes, especially with all the distance uh, and virtual learning that's happening right now so that there is more uh, information flowing out there to instructors, uh, especially best practices to do things uh, virtually. Um, 
there was a request, I believe, that came through Ryan Greenberg to Marie uh, to reach out to course sponsors to see if we can run faster EMT courses, expedited EMT courses, rapid courses with a condensed schedule. Um, there are course sponsors in the region that are already doing them. So we're going to be reaching out to them, um, ask what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, and if more of these classes can be run, we're just going to um, be careful how that is done, obviously, because of the competitive nature of these classes. Uh, we don't want to advantage or disadvantage one course sponsor over another. Um, just make sure that uh, those that do have a curriculum, if they are willing to share it um, and, and, and they're it definitely continues to be a need for these classes to be happening quicker because there is a shortage of providers out there. Um, in terms of reimbursement, there was some discussion about reimbursement. I'll, I'll leave the details off of here, um, but uh, there was some question about uh, having a standard voucher, whether, whether it would be possible to expedite some uh, EMTs, potentially increasing enrollment, I should say, increasing enrollment by, by having agencies um, assist folks that were not originally employed with an agency or a member of a volunteer organization that would typically be able to get vouchered for a class by a course sponsor um, initially, but those that uh, enrolled in a class before they were part of an EMS agency um, to help them with submission of a standard voucher. So that's something that could potentially assist with enrollment um, by getting these folks money for these classes. Um, Additionally, uh, we are a huge, huge uh, um, undertaking right now being taken by uh, Remsco's mental health team. We're going to be collaborating with them on uh, running classes, uh, both for suicide prevention and critical incident stress management, especially considering what's been going on over the last year. Um, so that is a that is a, a very big project. Uh, Monty Posner has been uh, uh, integral in making that happen. Um, so that's a collaboration between Remsco's mental health team, Training and Ed, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Uh, de-escalation is, is a, another project that's going to be taken on, uh, combining potentially several programs out there, including verbal judo, that can assist in uh, many of the situations that we encounter with the public, um, especially with the excited delirium protocol uh, and the amount of, of um, press that that gets. Um, that is essentially... It. I missed uh, one little piece here that I'll discuss with Dr. Lai offline about potentially formalizing um, having a member of training and ed that can either collaborate with a protocol committee or at least uh, uh, feed information back and forth between the two committees um, since we do have to train regularly on the protocols. Great. Thank you. Uh, any RTAC report? I don't think there's been a meeting. Regional Council update? I don't have um, the report, Marie, you didn't send it to me, but uh, I'll just report on that we have two um, CON expansions that are in process. There was a public hearing um, and we're gonna be voting on it at the next meeting, which is in, a, in two weeks. Uh, and nothing else really exciting happened other than um, we, again, we're grateful to uh, the staff Marie and all the others for all their work on the vaccinations. And we also noted uh, the passing of paramedic Gary Lava, who has been an instructor and has been in this regions and many agencies for many, many, many years. There are many paramedics who trained with him, worked with him. Um, and we had a moment of silence and we'll miss him. Thank you. Any uh, CMAC or SEMSCO update? No, there hasn't been a meeting. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing new. Nope. Yep. Meeting is in May. Yep. Also, also uh, unlikely to be in person. So we may yes. never meet again yeah. in person. But... Not until the fall, at least. Yep. yep. Um, does anyone have any unfinished business? Okay. The last item of business we have is the bylaws. This is the third revision review and vote. So I don't know, Marie, do you want to put up the bylaws or? Yeah, I'm going to find them. Just okay. give me a second. Oh my goodness. Can we Mac, Mac. Jeff, I'm sorry, it's Glenn to say that. Can I yeah. just bring something up while Marie sure. looks for it? 
Yep. Uh, so uh, I guess kind of new business, just a reminder, FYI, uh, we put a medical affairs directive out last Friday about JFK screening uh, passengers from uh, Guinea and uh, Democratic Republic of uh, Congo for possible Ebola. Uh, so the MAD kind of addresses that as to uh, how we would uh, try to respond to that if we get a call from JFK. Uh, CBP and CDC are screening. And anybody who's potentially suspicious and needs transport, they'll be calling uh, EMS. Everything through DOH should be going through telemetry, so we have a better idea, but just something that's coming up. Thanks. Yeah, just to add to that, the, the Remsco airport teams, we're the ones doing the screenings at JFK and uh, Newark. So. Okay, that's great. How, how you guys had done it uh, back in 2014. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay, let me see if I can share this screen, which will be a miracle. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to hope that these are the correct bylaws. Okay, these are the bylaws. These are the bylaws. They've been emailed. We've reviewed them twice. Does anyone have any comments, concerns? Yeah, I mean, they're here. If you have any questions, that the changes have not changed. This is the third meeting. This is, yep, our, our third meeting, and now we can actually vote on them, right? Because this is yeah. the third time unless anyone has any other comment, we will go ahead and vote to approve. Uh, is a Dr. Meyer here? Uh, I just wanted to make sure we have the right version. Can you scroll again? Okay, the last change that we made is we got uh, rid of- Oh yeah, okay, okay, sorry. Yep. No, no, that's okay. I'd rather talk about it now than approve it and find out there was a mistake. I mean, these are the only two changes. So that's it. All right. Um, I think Marie, Marie. Oh, yep. Marie. Yes. Art, go ahead. Simple, simple thing, but uh, at the top of the bylaws, it still says 2016. So uh, yeah, I think that's we going to be to... changed once, once we, we approve it. it. Yeah, when we approve it, it'll be updated right. to the month we approve it in. Yes. Right. Okay. Marie, can you go down, please, to the uh, that edition in blue? For the purposes of nominating representatives from the Medical Standards Committee, the chair of the Medical Standards will appoint a municipal FDY EMS physician and a non-municipal physician representative. That was one of the changes we had made last time. You did, you did you wanna say something? Just wanted to point out that we need a two thirds vote of the voting members of um, the REMAC, which is, of the total number of members of REMAC. And that's not just physicians, that's everyone. Uh, it says voting members of REMAC, that's what it says. And okay. I don't think that anyone, I don't think, I don't think I'm a voting member. No, your seat and Dr. Shalish's seat are, are not voting. Right, it says voting members, two thirds of the voting members, doesn't say only physicians. Mm -hmm. So do the arithmetic. I don't know exactly how many members we have. Okay, hold on, let me. Okay, votes. Okay, this is gonna be bylaws. Okay, I don't know if you're seeing this voting record, but. Is anyone seeing the voting record nope, or is it just me? Okay. Still, so. okay. Let me see if I can fix this. So this is oh, too many things on screen. God. Sorry. Okay, so I think we have, I'm just counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 25, 26, 27. We have 27 members. So let me just do some arithmetic here, which I should have done before. 27 but. position and members, Marie. We need 18 members. 27 members in total. Votes like this are not limited to physicians. They're everyone on the committee. And you need 18 members then. Two thirds of 27 is 18. Thank God you can add. Thank you. 
Oh, I have a calculator on my computer. All right. So whenever you're ready, Marie, you can call the roll and we'll vote on this. Okay. Then just uh, let me. Okay. Darn. File. They have a copy, and this is bylaws. And what we're voting on is to approve these bylaws as presented and read three consecutive meetings. Yes. Okay. So here we go. And as before, everyone can vote in favor, oppose, or abstain. So Robert Winchell. Sorry, having some connectivity here, um, but I approve the change. Thank you. Nick Alexandru. Yes, approve. Kevin Munjal. Kevin? All right, approve. Thank you. Cindy Basilios? Approve. Dario Gonzalez? Approve. Glenna Seda? In favor. Doug Isaacs? Yes. Nathan Reisman? Approve. Jeffrey Raybridge. Approve. Reed Caldwell. Reed Caldwell. Lewis Marshall. Approve. Mike Redlener. I approve. Wallace Carter. Approve. Laura Ivacoli. Approve. Peter Wire. Approve. Paul Barbara. Approve. David Benelli. Approve. Tim Stiles. Approve. Mark Cantor. Approve. Matt Harris. Approve. Robert Krupe. Approve. Art Cooper. Approve. Okay. Hold on, I need to go back. Sorry, just bear with me. Okay, Remac attendance. Come on. Okay, I just need to get the non physicians. Okay, Michael Vatch or Robert Ackerman? Robert Ackerman? In favor. Eric Cohen. Eric, are you still here? It's a long meeting. Okay. Grace Cacciola. Approve. Kevin Ward. Approve. Andrew Grigenti. Approve. Samia McEachin or Allison Burke. Okay, they're not here. Dominic Batnelli. And Sean Graves. I think our non physicians left. And that's it. So it's, uh, let me just do a quick count. I'm sure we have enough votes. Let me just count really quickly. Have to read, read the vote into the record the number of pro abstains and, and not here. Yeah. Hold on, I'm just trying to find my, it's too many things up on my screen, sorry. Come on, where are you? Okay. <sighs> sorry, I just can't get to my files. There's too much on my screen and I cannot get to it. Darn.
Come on, close. So close yet so far. Hold on. Okay. Uh, bylaws, bylaws, remake attendance, voting records. Okay. Oh, come on. Okay, remake. Voting sheets. Okay, open up. Sorry, I'm almost done. So we have. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. We have twenty-five votes in favor, so that's beyond the eighteen needed. It carries. Okay, uh, Marie, will you please check, send out the new bylaws, with all the you know marks on it. Um, to all the memberships of REMAC, they should have a copy. Okay. You want me to send it out marked up and then the... Unmarked. Unmarked, unmarked. okay. The, the yeah. final version should be sent clean to all copy. members. Right, yes. clean copy with the current, the date that it was marked, approved on, going to the date, and send yes. that. Yep. Then it becomes official. Okay. All right, I would like to thank the bylaws committee for their work on this, Dr. Marshall and your group. And uh, I don't believe, unless anyone else has uh, any other new business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Very Thank good. you very much. Everyone stay safe and have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, good, good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Can you, everyone. Stay here? Can you stop the, uh, the recording and all that?